Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Skillshare. Tune until the end to find out how you can try Skillshare absolutely free. That's right, partner. Live free and join. Okay, video time. So, this is a video I never expected to make. I figured I had said my piece about this film and I could move on with my life now. But two things dragged me back in. Number one, The Rise of Skywalker really made me reevaluate a lot of the choices this film made. And I think it was worth revisiting now that I've seen this piece of commercial diarrhea. And number two, I wanted to ask y'all something. Have you noticed that fans of The Last Jedi have gone COMPLETELY INSANE? There's this prevailing notion on film Twitter that anyone who doesn't like this movie is a tasteless moron. And like, is this movie really the one you want to say that about? I'm honestly really happy that people love this film. Hell, if you love Rise of Shitwalker, I'm very happy for you because getting mad over other people's film opinions is such an idiotic thing to do. So instead of disregarding someone's opinions on cinema and politics because they don't like an awkward casino space horse movie, how about we all take a chill pill and recognize that as long as you're not a racist sexist piece of garbage, your opinion on this movie is valid. If you think this is the best Star Wars movie, that's valid. If you think this is the worst Star Wars movie, that's valid. If you disagree with either of those two statements, then you can leave my video now because I am making this video exclusively for sane people. Here is a sane discussion about the things that I like and dislike about the movie. Feel free to disagree with anything I say as long as you're not a racist sexist moron. Now then, I wrote a letterbox review of this movie a few weeks before watching Rise of Skywalker, and this video is gonna be a further elaboration on my points in that review. With some added perspective now that Rise of Skywalker exists. I'll do what Jenny Nicholson did that one time and make this a compliment sandwich. Go back and forth between positive and negative statements about this movie. Without further ado, let's start with something completely non-controversial. I may have gone too far in a few places, but oh well. Luke in this movie is friggin' awesome in my humble opinion that you can disagree with because no one is objectively right about whether or not this was a good direction to take his character, but I don't know. I think it was. I like him here. Luke Starkiller is a bitter old coot, and nearly everything involving him in this movie is fantastic. Nearly. The lightsaber toss is a bit too goofy, sure. Ideally, he would have dropped it on the ground instead of tossing it over the shoulder. Like, that's what I expect the LEGO game cutscene to do. But still, turning Luke into a crusty old hermit who's drowning in despair and self-loathing is super interesting. J.J. Abrams gave us inherently uncreative choices for Han and Leia in this new trilogy. What's Han doing 30 years later? Uh, he's still smuggling and stuff. What's Leia doing? Uh, she's still generaling and stuff. Wow, that's so riveting. Granted, both of them are entertaining in those roles, but I'm glad Ryan decided to take Luke in a different direction. If Luke was raring to go to train Rey and save Leia and face down the entire First Order, that would be fun, sure. But it's not as interesting as seeing Luke go through a dynamic character change. Seeing him come to grips with his depression and trauma is just really powerful and unexpected. I could see why people didn't like it, but I think it's really neat. The most contentious element of Luke's story, of course, is learning that he considered killing Kylo. Luke, the guy who saw the good in Darth Vader even when Obi-Wan and Yoda didn't, suddenly thinks his nephew is beyond saving and nearly kills him out of pure instinct. Oh, the horror! How could he do that? This is easily the toughest pill to swallow about the entire movie, and I definitely hated this character choice for the longest time. But honestly, I've kind of come around to it now. Luke is not a perfect character. He's never been. We all kind of assume that he always makes the right choices because he's Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master. This untouchable deity who's grown so wise and powerful that he's completely infallible. This is the Luke Skywalker that everyone in The Force Awakens is extremely excited to find. This is the Luke Skywalker that's gonna single-handedly turn the tide of the war and save the day. This is the Luke Skywalker that doesn't exist. This portion of the movie is about rejecting the myth and coming to terms with the harsh reality of who this guy really is. He slipped up. He did something so ill-befitting of his character that it ruined everything and haunted him for years. And hinging the entire story on such an egregious contradiction of the person we think Luke is, is brilliant. He is not a myth. He is a man. And no man is infallible, as difficult to accept as that is. Luke acted on pure instinct, without thinking, and immediately regretted his decision. I feel like the people who claim he actively tried to kill Ben are misremembering what actually happened. I've got more to say about Luke and his arc in later segments, but suffice to say, I like it. Especially compared to... 
The first order in this movie is an absolute joke. And treating your villains like a joke is a really bad idea. Force Awakens opens with the First Order burning down a village and executing all the villagers. They're established right from the get-go to be ruthless, calculating, and pure evil. This is what Last Jedi opens with. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Tell him Leia has an urgent message for him. I believe he's tooling with you, sir. About his mother. This isn't cute. This is a tone killer. Five minutes into the movie, the tone is effectively butchered. All these angry, screaming lunatics in the First Order aren't intimidating in the slightest, which makes the fairly standard space action that much more tensionless. Seriously, remember Hux's frightening speech in Force Awakens? Remember how he came across as an equal to Kylo Ren despite not having Force powers? Well, now he's getting wiped across the floor, tossed around, called a rabid cur, whatever that means. God, Ryan really wasted this character that could have been as intimidating as Tarkin, but just wasn't for some reason. Dom Hall Gleason deserved better. Captain Phasma is also hysterically underused, getting killed after a combined total of 10 minutes of screen time between two movies. I don't understand what the point of killing Finn's main rival was if you're just gonna leave him alive at the end. It results in him having nothing to do anymore. Phasma is just a worthless inclusion in both of these movies, and it's laughable. Then there's Big Boy Snoke, whose death was actually one of the story beats I liked on my first viewing. I also like his death scene because it's so hilarious and idiotic that it's great. I've said it before, but the sexual satisfaction he expresses regarding Kylo's lightsaber is just a hoot. But his inability to notice Kylo turning the lightsaber right next to him is really silly, his stupid face when he gets killed slays me, and his stupider face when his body lies on the ground is just a bit too much. Every villain in this movie who isn't Kylo is treated like a joke. And how am I supposed to feel tension as a result? You expect me to believe these buffoons could operate an efficient, sinister, fascist military regime? I know that's weird coming from someone whose favorite movie of 2019 was Jojo Rabbit, but like, that movie expertly portrays Nazis as hateful while also coming from the perspective of a 10 year old boy. Goofiness is acceptable there, not here. The Empire was never goofy, aside from a couple cheeky lines the Emperor had, but he was still a commanding, evil presence. The prequels turned him goofy, and and while that was fun... No. 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 Come on, man. But I think it's weird that people say Revenge of the Sith is this big joke that can't be taken seriously while giving this movie a pass. Its humor is genuinely on the same level as the prequels to me. It destroys the tone of what should be intense or dramatic scenes and really takes me out of the film. There's a cute line here or there and a couple things I chuckled at, but for the most part, this movie constantly feels like a weak attempt to be Marvel. But even the best Marvel movies know to let dramatic moments play out and really leave an impact. This movie does too in key moments, and I appreciate that, but again. Shirtless Kylo Ren is what I expect from the LEGO adaptation. Stop stealing their joke ideas. Oh well, back to the good stuff. <laughs> Rey is pretty awesome in this movie. I like how she constantly overestimates her own abilities for a change. She completely fails to turn Kylo back to the light and Snoke kinda wipes the floor with her. I think this movie effectively kills the Mary Sue argument and I'm very happy about that. The people who reasonably were not into Rey's character because of her lack of real struggles in Force Awakens might have a better time with her here. I already liked Rey a lot in Force Awakens, but I understand people who were bored by her natural abilities. Of course, now we all know why she's so powerful. Yay, are you happy now? But in all honesty, I've grown to like what they do in this movie with her parents. I thought the Million Ray cave was just an overly long, tedious way of giving us absolutely no information. Which it was, but that's kind of the point here. Rey is completely disappointed to learn nothing about where she came from or who her parents are. Everyone's expecting it to be someone famous like Luke or Obi-Wan or Watto or Dexter Jetster. This is one of the expectation subversions that I think actually pays off. By making her parents nobodies, it's an absolutely crushing reveal. That's the last thing she wants to hear, that her parents really didn't care about her, that she truly does come from nowhere, that no one cared for her until she met these new resistance buddies. In all honesty, backtracking on this reveal is the single worst mistake the Rise of Skywalker made. It's kind of scary knowing she's related to the Star Wars equivalent of the Antichrist, but just knowing that her parents loved her and cared about her and sold her off to protect her just feels like such a cheap, 
easy way out. Again, I didn't realize what a good reveal Rey's parentage in Last Jedi was until Rise of Skywalker shat the bed and made me reconsider the message here. Good people can come from anywhere to rise up against oppression, and your bloodline really doesn't matter. An explanation for Rey's natural force gift would be nice, but to me, it really isn't necessary. And if it's necessary to you, there you go, JJ's got you covered. But I think the message of Ryan's story is far more compelling than offering a literal hereditary explanation for Rey's abilities. JJ seems more concerned with the nitty gritty, while Ryan seems more interested in the mythos, the interesting themes that the story can twist in fascinating, unexpected ways. Now with that said, Rey's storyline is not perfect in this movie because I never said this was an amazing movie overall because it is not. I hate the way she gets shattered after from the narrative and the climax. She has nothing to do but shoot from the Falcon and lift some rocks. I get that the climax is focused on Luke and Kylo, but her excitement and upbeat attitude is so jarring when she was just hit with such a devastating truth. Maybe that's why the They Were Nobodies reveal didn't sink in for me. Cause the movie promptly forgets about it in the climax, and that's wildly disappointing. Luke had to let the reality of his heritage sink in, and it devastated him. Rey seems pretty over it, even though finding out who her parents were was kinda the entire crux of her character for the past two movies. Uh, James, I was told to edit the prose, but all you're giving me right now are cons. Oh, see why this movie's hard to like? It always manages to ruin great ideas. Like... Finn and Rose's casino subplot is honestly just as bad as people say it is, if not worse. I don't have a problem with a casino in Star Wars. It's a neat idea to see the 1% and see how they're exploiting the poor in an oppressed galaxy. Anyway, let's talk about Rose real quick. I've said this before, but I love this first scene with her. It's powerful that she's mourning her dead sister, whose death I didn't care about because they waited until now, after she's dead, to establish their bond when one scene between the two of them before the mission started would have been perfect. I guess if Ryan added that scene, we wouldn't have time for Poe to prank call General Huckleberry, and we can't just not have that in the movie. Anyway, Paige's death does absolutely nothing for me, but I really feel for Rose here, and I love how adorable she is as this fangirl who's really starstruck by Finn. It's a cute character trait that is thrown in the garbage because she becomes action girl with nauseating dialogue for the rest of the movie. Anyway, they devise an idiotic plan and escape to the casino, and this really undermines the entire dramatic crux of the story. If Finn and Rose can easily sneak away on this little pod that has light speed, then why doesn't the entire resistance do that? They got away with no one noticing. Leia says herself that the First Order is not monitoring for little transports. Each pod could probably fit like 20 people on it. It'd be a little cramped, but this is such a better solution than hoping the First Order doesn't realize they went to the giant salt planet right there. A am I missing something? Because it feels like no one ever talks about this when it effectively renders two-thirds of the movie entirely pointless. Please tell me if there's a line of dialogue somewhere that explains why this isn't a viable option. I I, I really need to know. Anyway, y'all know the rest. Finn and Rose fail because they are stupid. They park their resistance shuttle out in the open on the beach, and frankly, they're lucky that this asshole is the only one who had a problem with that. First Order sympathizers seem to be everywhere in this galaxy. An urgent mission to find the codebreaker turns into Finn gawking at all the sh stuff, while Rose gives a lengthy lecture about the ethics of space horses, while saying a really corny line straight out of a George Lucas script. I wish I could put my fist through this whole lousy, beautiful town. That's the most horrible thing I've ever heard. BB-8 is the only one concerned about this mission and actually doing his part. And again, this entire sequence is just so tonally inappropriate given the oppressive atmosphere in the other plot lines. Empire Strikes Back did not have awkward slapstick juxtaposed with Luke training on Dagobah and Han and Leia escaping the Empire. How exactly is this movie as good as Empire Strikes Back when a third of it is basically Attack of the Clones? The entire casino subplot actively harms the pace, tone, atmosphere, and purpose of the other two plot lines. But you know what? It's okay. Because Rose had fun. And it's all good. Because they saved the animals. Aww. You know, I like the idea behind the final scene of the movie. In execution, it just feels like an ad for Galaxy's Edge. But still, ending the movie with some Force-sensitive child looking out into space and standing as a new hope? That's really cool. But it was not worth this film-breaking nonsense. Oh, also, DJ is a stupid character. I hate his weird stutter. I hate that his betrayal is meant to be a subversion when it's so blatantly obvious. I hate that it's a waste of a great actor. Canto Bite sucks. Every time it cut back to Rey and Luke, I thought to myself, Oh, thank God, we're back to the real movie. Anyway, back to the real movie. 
Ryan Johnson delivered a hot mess of a script, but I don't think anyone can really doubt his directing abilities after seeing this movie. It is gorgeous from beginning to end. One of my favorite little touches is this establishing shot where you see a ship that looks like an iron touching down, then you pull back and realize, oh shit, it was an iron! I like that. Luke's training sessions with Rey feel very avant-garde for Star Wars. The many somber shots of Leia speak volumes without saying any words. The design of Crate is absolutely inspired, with the streaks of red salt juxtaposed with the white ground looking truly phenomenal. Cinematography wise, this film blows most other big blockbusters away. In fact, my favorite shot in all of Star Wars is this one. The red salt symbolizing the blood-soaked battlefield from the massacre that the First Order just committed. And Luke's just gonna walk out into it and stare them all down? spectacular. But we'll talk about the climax more later. I also love the way the forced voice chat scenes are shot and edited. The sound design on them is great, as is the way Rey and Kylo almost connect before Luke busts their sleepover wide open. I also have to give props to the actors for really selling a lot of the garbage dialogue. There's really not a bad performance in the bunch once you separate the characters from the acting. Maybe Laura Dern is a little miscast, but otherwise everyone gives their A-game and their connections with each other feel so natural. Even Finn and Rose have good platonic chemistry before before Ryan massacred the goodwill I have for their relationship. And I think it's no surprise that Adam Driver absolutely carries this franchise on his broad shoulders. He has the one consistently great character in all three of these movies, and that's because he sells Kylo's anguish and emotional torment perfectly. And regardless of how he was written, I think it's hard to argue that Mark Hamill's best performance as Luke Skywalker is in this movie. He portrays so much of Luke's inner torment so well. One last thing, in case you had any doubts about Ryan's directing abilities, just look at the light speed ram. I kind of didn't want to talk about this because I truly don't have a defense for it from a lore perspective, but holy sh**, it's the most visually striking and astounding thing I've ever seen in a Star Wars movie. Having every dramatic beat converge in this one spectacular moment is unreal. From a filmmaking perspective, this scene is a 12 out of 10. If you hate it because it breaks Star Wars conventions, that's fair. It probably does. But I thought about it, and the thing is... I really don't care, so whatever. Good job, Holdo. I wish I could say that about anything else you do. Holdo and Poe's plotline is asinine. I want to get this part over with as quickly as possible because this is easily the part of the movie I hate the most, and I don't feel like talking about it. Bottom line is, Poe was in the wrong. I get why Holdo didn't tell him the plan. He's untrustworthy and potentially dangerous. Got it. But the problem is, she doesn't tell anyone the plan. Poe had four people on his side with this, and they're not all untrustworthy hotshot flyboys. They also wanted to know what was going on. Holdo is a bad leader, plain and simple. This never should have gotten to the point where a mutiny took place. And there's a simple solution to this problem that everyone has already brought up. All Holdo needed to say was that they were concerned about a spy, and that's why the plan was top secret. In fact, cutting Canto Bite entirely and making this about Finn, Rose, and Poe, trying to find the mole within the resistance would have been so much better. When Hux first said they had the resistance tied to the end of a string, I got really intrigued. I thought there was some sort of interesting betrayal in store. But no, it's just a boring lightspeed tracker that Snoke for some reason had no knowledge of? Are you not in charge of this entire First Order? Why was this news to you? Did anyone proofread this script? Anyway, yeah, Poe and Holdo were both in the wrong as the story is now, but the movie is firmly on the white lady's side instead of the Guatemalan man. That's a bit questionable. But oh well, you know what? Making your only prominent Latino character into a hothead that constantly needs to be put in his place by white people isn't good. But at least they didn't add a backstory where he was a drug-running criminal in his adolescence. Can you imagine? I mean, at least Poe learns a lesson and has a tangible arc, I guess. Whatever. Back to not terrible stuff. The Dagobah Squad. I called this segment the Dagobah Squad because it's about the three characters who chilled on Dagobah at some point in time. Luke, Yoda, and R2-D2. These are some of the best scenes in Star Wars, not just this movie. I love Force Awakens, but boy does it love to throw nostalgia all over the place with no rhyme or reason. Oh boy, it's the training ball as seen in Attack of the Clones and some other movie I'm forgetting. Oh look, it's the chessboard as seen in Solo, A Star Wars Story, and maybe something else, I'm not sure. Nostalgia Nostalgia runs rampant in this movie, but Last Jedi is much more subdued and smart about it. When Luke enters the Falcon and reunites with R2, that's already a really powerful moment because of how prominently these two were best buds in the original trilogy. And when Luke tells R2 he isn't coming back to the fight, 
rejecting the call to adventure in a sense, R2 plays him the message that got him into the fight in the first place. This is honestly one of the most touching things in all of Star Wars. This is how you organically weave nostalgia into your story. This is brilliant. But the Yoda scene has grown to perhaps be my favorite in the entire film. Even though I still think the puppet looks weird. But you know, it's better than the Phantom Menace puppet, so sure, I guess, I don't know. Yoda is the perfect character to talk some sense into Luke and get him to realize the value of failure and what it can teach us. How we can grow from and move past those traumatic experiences. How we should let the younger generation carve their own path without having to rely on us for guidance all the time. The score, visuals, and writing all come together to make a profoundly touching moment that briefly makes you forget the issues this movie has. It's such a valuable dramatic scene and its beauty should not go overlooked. The sacred Jedi texts! Oh, read them have you? Well, I mean, page turners, they were not. <laughs> I think you people really misunderstand the problem with this scene. The fact that Leia knows how to use the force and could survive space as a result is not the issue. I have no trouble believing her fight or flight force reflexes kicked in here. The airlock thing is a logistical problem, but I can get over that too. What I hate here is that such a potentially beautiful scene is ruined by such an awkward, unintentionally funny visual. Like, I don't know what they could do to make this look good, but holy guacamole, this is not how you do it. Again, I must stress, Leia surviving space using the Force is A-OK -okay on paper. It just looks like garbage, and on my first viewing, it was the moment I decided that this movie was not gonna work for me. Also, I will forever be disappointed with the deletion of two crucial scenes. Luke reacting to the death of Han, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's heartbreaking, and as is, he just asks, where's Han? And it cuts to Kylo. Like, the story just wants to get on with itself and not take any time for character drama. Really weird. Even worse is the deletion of Finn's confrontation with Captain Phasma, where he berates her for lowering the shields at Starkiller base, leading her to kill her own troops before they turn on her. It's badass and gives one of the lamest scenes from Force Awakens a ton of retroactive purpose. It's such an awesome moment, but without it, Finn couldn't have called her Chrome Dome. That's way more important and you know it. But you know what? Enough mixing the positives and negatives. Let's give some actual mixed thoughts. This one just genuinely confuses me. Everyone raves about the fight with the Praetorian Guards like it's the greatest fight scene in all of Star Wars, and I'm not here to nitpick the choreography or anything, though that's certainly doable. All I have to say is, it's a pretty good, extremely pointless battle. It has one cool narrative purpose, showcasing a team-up between Rey and Kylo. Okay, that's pretty badass, and that first long take establishes that idea really well. But after that, it literally has the same level of emotional investment as the Darth Maul fight in Phantom Menace. Scratch that, it has less. <laughs> These guys have the same amount of character as pre-Clone Wars Darth Maul. They are cool visuals and nothing else. What are they even fighting for anyway? Snoke is already dead. Just move on with your lives, guys. You're clearly no match for two of the most powerful Force users in the entire saga. Look, the fight's cool, they've got cool weapons, I like when Kylo shreds the dude and then stabs a guy in the head with a lightsaber goes zoom zoom <laughs> It's pretty cool, but again, it's cool in the prequel sense where the fights mean nothing because there's no investment in the character dynamics. I'll take the Darth Maul fight any day simply because it looks cooler and also do up the fates. But again, I still like the throne room fight because it also looks cool. And that's it. I don't know, please leave me comments about this scene in particular. I genuinely really want to know why y'all are so obsessed with it. <laughs> So, the climax brings all of our characters together. Actually, let me be more specific, because there's kind of two climaxes. The first climax is amazing, like I said earlier. The second climax on Crate is amazing when it focuses on the characters who have been amazing the whole movie. It's not when Rose says the single worst line in Star Wars this side of the prequels. Let's start from the beginning. Rose and Finn accidentally their way into the base at the end, look around, and Rose says, Is this all that's left? Yeah. 
thanks to you two. Side note though, isn't it kind of bonkers that their plan actually would have worked if it wasn't for BB9E? Give that droid a raise, he effectively massacred 90% of the resistance. But Finn and Rose don't learn a lesson at all despite getting so many of their friends and comrades killed. Hell, even though Poe learned his lesson, he still gets no repercussions for this awful plan. Leia just says, yeah, you can follow him now, he learned his lesson. But like, earlier he was demoted for letting 20 people die. He should be expelled from the resistance order! Anyway, Anyway, the climax. So the action here is fine, blah blah blah. Then we get to Finn's big sacrifice. I'm glad he learned to lay down his life for the resistance rather than running away, but apparently it's just the thought of doing that that counts, because we get a fake out death which should have killed Rose and Finn, but okay then. This is what effectively killed Rose for a lot of the sane, non-racist fans. She robs Finn of a really powerful moment, a scene I was really invested in on my first viewing of the movie, all because apparently it's more important to save what we love rather than then fight what we hate. But she acts as if those things are mutually exclusive. They're not. Holdo literally fought what she hated in order to save what she loved. She got her big heroic sacrifice moment and it was great. Luke actually does win the day by saving what he loves and not fighting what he hates, which is pretty neat thematically, but it doesn't excuse the wildly inappropriate use of this line given the destruction occurring immediately behind them and the awkward kiss as a cherry on top of this disgusting Sunday. Some people say Finn's sacrifice would have been pointless and his ship wouldn't have stopped the laser, but you could easily write it so it would. Rose is trying to convey that living to fight another day is more important than a short-term sacrifice but it contradicts the actions of Holdo and Luke, whose sacrifices directly contribute to the survival of the Resistance. It is a line at war with itself. It's also important to consider where Finn and Rose end up in the next movie, taking this moment into account. I wholeheartedly contend that Finn dying here, with his main rival already dispatched and his arc fulfilled, would have been a stronger storytelling decision than keeping him alive. It would have been a truly shocking development that would have given his character some meaning. I say this because Finn is a complete afterthought in The Rise of Skywalker. He could be cut from the movie with not much changing. A talented writer could have given him a new compelling arc, but look who we're dealing with. I like the idea of him encouraging other deserters in the First Order, but this is never expanded upon. He is unfortunately rendered worthless in this movie, and this entire trilogy more or less. I believe his sacrifice here would have given some worth to his story, and I think it would have been so interesting to then build a central trio out of Rey, Poe, and Rose. Would it be sad to never see Finn and Rey interact again, especially after Rey said they would see each other again in Force Awakens? Yes. Yes, it would, which is exactly the same remorse we feel for Luke and Han. I think that's the profound sense of loss that this ending sorely lacked. All these nameless resistance members are dead, but we don't know them personally. Luke died, but no one's ever really gone, so it's no biggie. He can just force ghost his way into the next movie. And sure, Holdo died, but... That's enough about Finn though, let's talk about Rose. Undoubtedly the biggest victim of fan backlash in Star Wars history, I truly believe the venomous hatred for Rose Tico would not have been so significant if she were written better. Don't get me wrong, there's so many racist, sexist pieces of garbage out there who exclusively hated her character because they're the scum of humanity. Actors and writers never deserve to be harassed for portraying or writing a character that people don't like. Like, seriously, what is wrong with you people? But it's reasonable to claim that Rose was simply not a well-written character, and her inclusion drives an unnecessary wedge between Finn and Poe, two characters with great chemistry who many fans, myself included, were disappointed to see separated. I, I actually, um wrote in the first very first draft i wrote of it like poe went with finn on the mission to canto bite and the two of them were going to be together on the mission um and it didn't work at all because those two get along too well and so it was just really boring what? i thought rose's monologues and romantic inclinations towards finn were inappropriate to the context of the dramatic story and this line in the climax was truly the nail in the coffin for me i did not consider rose to be a well-written character but I said the same thing about Elsa in Frozen 1, and oh look, I was excited at the prospect of her being written better in Frozen 2, and I thought she was. So I was actually mildly excited to see more of Rose Tico. I hoped she would win me over this time. Moreover, I was happy to see that she already won a lot of fans over in The Last Jedi. I didn't get it, but I also didn't care, because liking her character is a harmless and understandable opinion. 
Anyway, I was excited to see Rose play a significant supporting role in The Rise of Skywalker and she got less than 90 seconds of screen time. Why? Because man babies on the internet didn't like her? What about the people who fell in love with her character and wanted to see more of her? What about the people with reasonable complaints about her actions and dialogue who wanted to see her become better? This is the part where you write her better and win people over. A lot of people didn't like Ahsoka at first, but instead of writing her out of the show, they made her better. They allowed her to grow as a person, develop a less childish person personality and become a more mature, well-rounded character, to the point where she is now a fan favorite. I wanted to see Rose become a fan favorite, but instead, J.J. Abrams and the screenwriter of Justice League gave in to hate. Don't give in to hate. That leads to the shark side. As in the side of Shark Tale. As in, I'd rather rewatch Shark Tale than your shitty ass movie, JJ! So Finn completed his entire story arc in the second movie and Rose did something really stupid. Why do I like this climax again? Oh yeah, Luke. This is when the climax gets insanely good. Luke's farewell to Leia is incredibly powerful and resonant. I especially love his line, no one's ever really gone, since it's a touching sentiment despite being turned into a meme. Seriously, I hate when YouTubers turn potentially emotional and harrowing lines of dialogue into memes. Like, come on, that was their mistake. Also, the wink to 3PO is everything I could have hoped for. So with that striking cinematography and amazing score in tow, Luke prepares to face the entire First Order down in the ultimate power move. Kylo's rage and resentment is perfectly illustrated by the massive overkill he sets forth, which inspires one of the three jokes in the movie I actually like. Do you think you got him? But Luke remains undeterred, still standing. Luke and Kylo exchange some words and prepare to fight, all while Poe realizes the importance of what Luke is doing. He probably should have told him that was his plan, but that doesn't make for compelling cinema, so whatever. But yeah, Poe understands that Luke is allowing them to fight another day and become a symbol of hope. It's really cool that Luke, despite resenting his status as a legend throughout the entire movie, now realizes that there is a place in the galaxy for legends, and that his noble sacrifice will inspire hope and eventually peace. His arc is absolutely beautiful, and it all comes to a head in this final showdown with Kylo. And while I personally would have loved to see the Jedi Order end with Rey forging a new order, there is something so powerful about Luke, emboldened with an optimistic view of the future, proudly stating that he will not be the last Jedi. This is the first movie in Star Wars history to drop its title within the film, and it does so masterfully. Luke then encourages Kylo to do what Vader did to Obi-Wan, strike him down as a diversion. Kylo takes the bait, only to find... <laughs> That's right. Luke's astral projection ability is so cool. Why didn't he come to the planet himself? Uh, he would have got shot to pieces. Remember when Coleman Trevor tried to kill Count Dooku and then Jango Fett just shot him a couple times and he died? Imagine that, but with 10 AT-ATs. He showed off a cool force power and won the day. He probably would have died even if he did come down to the planet. What's the difference between him being or not being on the planet? This movie has so many problems and yet you people complain about the weirdest things. And yeah, I've said this before, but I love Luke's death scene. I'm a little confused why he takes his robot hands with him to the afterlife, but this twin sons gazing is just so profound. It gives his story so much more meaning and beauty. Again, a profound, artistic use of nostalgia. I wish JJ knew the meaning of those words. I hate to end on a con, but that's how the movie ends, so yeah. The happy feel-good reunion on the Falcon as it travels through Lightspeed just irks me. Rey, Finn, and Rose miserably failed and it didn't seem to affect them whatsoever. 90% of the Resistance is dead and everyone is happy. I famously made this comparison before, but imagine Infinity War ending with all the remaining Avengers hugging and congratulating themselves for surviving the snap. Imagine Tony and Nebula flying home super fast, playing paper football in good spirits. That's how Last Jedi ends. It shouldn't try to make you feel good. The reality of this horrific day should be setting in, and I wholeheartedly believe this is a byproduct of Disney's influence. Ending a Star Wars movie in a sad way is bad for business. Hyperspace adventure time! Marvel can do what they want though, they already made us enough money that they earned one sad ending. Star Wars still has to meet its quota. But you know what? I'll end on something positive anyway. I know I said the broom boy ending was corny. 
which it is, but it still shows that a hero could rise from anywhere, from extremely humble beginnings, much like Rey. It's a great idea, but a meh, not very good execution, which is a consistent theme throughout the entire movie. I want to love The Last Jedi. Over the course of the past two years, I've kind of come around to this movie in a similar character arc to Luke's. After my first viewing, I felt underwhelmed, upset annoyed, disappointed. I had no interest in seeing what came next, and I truly believed that it was time for Star Wars to end. I started teaching my pupils why the legacy of this film was failure, hypocrisy, hubris. But since then, I've had people talk some sense into me, teach me things about the film I never considered, and realize that there's a sense of truth, of purpose, of beauty that I couldn't fully grasp at first. Nothing will ever make up for its flaws, much like nothing will ever erase the failure of the Jedi Order. But it does enough right that I'm glad it exists and managed to inspire people. It taught me a valuable lesson, that there's a certain excellence in failure. This movie failed to take many of the storylines in Force Awakens in exciting directions. It concluded everyone's character arcs and left no intriguing plot threads for a third film to work with. It frustrated, bored, or irritated me more often than the average Star Wars film. I personally do not consider this to be a very good film overall. And yet, without its failure, I never would have gotten amazingly directed and shot sequences like these in Star Wars. I never would have appreciated seeing Mark Hamill's tremendous acting chops in live action. I never would have been intrigued by Ryan Johnson as a filmmaker and seeked out his other works. I never would have seen some incredibly bold, risky, and ultimately brilliant storytelling that pushed the boundaries of what Star Wars could accomplish. I would not have reconsidered my feelings on this movie had Rise of Skywalker not left me so empty, so devoid of investment in any way. I found its filmmaking sterile, its storytelling baffling, its ideas uninspired, and its essence hollow. And aside from the baffling storytelling, I can't say any of those things about Last Jedi. It's a mess on so many levels, but it's a beautiful mess. One that I'm happy I experienced. At the end of the day, I can watch this movie and have a good time, like I can with any Star Wars movie that is an Attack of the Clones. What? Dare I say? I I might consider this movie pretty good if I fast forward the Canto Bite stuff. With that gone, I can tolerate Poe and Holdo's Dance of Deception because the focus is now on a beautiful story of regret, sorrow, and failure. It hits hard seeing our childhood hero go through this self-inflicted trial of will. Maybe that's not what you wanted from him, and that's okay. But I'm happy I got to see this. It was beautiful. Feel free to disagree. Feel free to feel any way you want about this movie as long as you don't harass anyone. Because at the end of the day, it's just a movie. Arguing about Star Wars is what we grow beyond. That is the true burden of all fans. As I enjoy this delightful warmth, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. They offer classes designed for real life, so you can move your creative journey forward without putting life on hold. You can learn and grow with short classes that fit your busy routine. You can explore all sorts of topics such as film and video, creative writing, animation, graphic design, and much more. Join millions of people using Skillshare and take the next step in your creative journey. Explore thousands of inspiring classes that fit your schedule and skill level. One of my favorite classes is DIY Cinematography, Make Your Video Look Like a Movie by Ryan Booth. As someone with a keen interest in visually stunning movies and how directors achieve such looks, this class taught me so much about the art of cinematography and how to make personal projects look infinitely better. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. But even better is that handy dandy link in the description that'll get you two months of premium membership absolutely free. It's free knowledge, how can you say no to that? Click the link in the description to get two free months of premium membership and explore your creativity.